Look at this room. Dee Dee, welcome. I'm going to do a formal introduction and we'll get going. Oh, God. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yeah. All right. Welcome, everybody. What a beautiful day. Who can imagine that it, we're in the midst of the holiday season with beautiful weather like this? I'm Donna Paz Kaufman, and with my husband, Mark Kaufman, we opened Story and Song in 2018, so we're three years old. And we opened this second story space with the art gallery and this open seating for community connection and conversation. So it's a pleasure today to introduce you, if you don't already know, local celebrity, Dee Dee Bartels. <laughs> and I'm so glad, Dee Dee, we have this opportunity to talk because there's a lot that many of us don't know about you and your writing and your life. There's a lot of things I don't want anybody to know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that's for another time. Oh, Under a, a fictitious name. Well, what stays, what's, what's said in story and song, Stays. 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 So you'll still tell us what you want and, and keep close to your heart things that you don't. So why don't we start with this? Let's, yeah. let's start with a mini biography of your life, where you grew up, the major chapters, what happened, what were the pivotal moments to make Dee Dee Bartels, the woman she is right now at 97 on Amelia Island. And then we'll talk about your writing and some other th and where okay. you're going with your writing. But tell okay. us about you. Okay, I was born in Victoria, British Columbia, of a French father, and uh, my mother. We're Heinz, if not a variety. There was um, Italian, Spanish were the two Italian, Spanish were the two main ones. Then there was just to pep things up. Uh, uh, Irish great grandmother, great great grandmother, and there was Portuguese. So there, there was just a mess of stuff. But um, and let me see. I don't know what we were doing in Canada because our home was in Miami and Key West. The, the Italian the Santinis and the Santana, the Spanish and the Italians, were early Florida settlers that came down. They came into. Uh, Virginia and the 16 somethings and worked their way down and ended up on the west coast and of Florida and uh, where Fort, Fort Myers in that area is today and in Miami my father and mother were there on Biscayne Boulevard and so I grew up in a house with adults but um, there were no children around there was a wonderful we had, my dad had a huge library it was a wonderful Wonderful. That that's where I live, mm. and we sailed. And my dad was one of the uh, charter members of the Key Biscayne Yacht Club. And he sailed. He was a wild Frenchman. And one of the things I remember, most, he died when I was eight. Most remembered oh. about him was when Prohibition came. Mm -hmm. He's a big man. He's about six foot three. He went. Ah, the world's going to hell. He said, "It's going back to the cave." He said, "When a man can't have his wine with his dinner." Oh, and, he, and he just had a fit. And he was a very, very Catholic. He helped put up the money for the Jesuit church. He did everything for the Catholic religion. And this good man, his, he, his sailboat was the Nickety. It was a big, beautiful big boat, moored right in front of our house. Found, he ordered from France every six months. He had six cases of good French wine sent to the Catholic priest in Nassau. <laughs> <laughs> and he would, on the dark moon, he would sail over, get his, leave one case for the priest. When he died, he left the house that I loved most. It was called Westwood Ho in Nassau. We had a summer house. He left that to the Catholic priest for recreation. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, he was some man. He died when I was eight. And my mother was, um, I didn't miss having other children around because when I was young, she would, uh, she read me all the fairy tales, all the once upon a time and lived happy ever after, that kind of thing. And it was great. Um, and then when my father died, she sent me to the convent, to boarding school. Uh, it was a 
French Canadian order, but they were in Key West, the poor things wearing wool gowns and mm. sweating and dying. Mm. And, okay. <laughs> but what is the joke they had at the time? But it was, I loved it there. It was fun until I got older. But I came out knowing absolutely nothing that you could earn a living and having no idea how stupid it really was. It was fun. <laughs> uh, opportunities have just fallen in my lap all my life. Somebody's looking out for me. I don't know who. <laughs> what was the first opportunity after school? Um, well, I stopped down to, there was a radio station. We had just finally gotten a radio station. We had no TV for years and years and years. And I stopped down there and I said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> and he said, well, I was on Stock Island when I went up. I said, you have all the awful rock and roll and jazzy music. And I said, there are people here. We listen to the Cubans so we can get good Cuban music and, and, uh, and classical music. And, uh, and I said, you don't have anything for women. It's all just sports and stuff, nothing for women. And he said, I suppose you could do something. I said, of course. <laughs> and so I ended up, he gave me one half hour on Saturday and told me to get my own, uh, I had to get my own sponsors. And so I got enough sponsors. I ended up with a daily radio show and it was loads <laughs> of fun. Who were your sponsors? Uh, the one I went to first were the charter fishermen. And I had one, I wish I had thought to bring it. It's a classic. It's a, I got from the radio station. I got it when I left. It, this man, a tour, he was from Chicago. He caught a huge sailfish. And I, my guy, the charter fisherman called me and I came down with my engineer and they were taping it. And the guy said, and then I looked at, he had this, this thing, <laughs> all, every other word is bleeding. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. But I've all I've gotten a lot of credit for for many many things that the credit shouldn't have been mine, um, like the thing where I went I got the the um, I bid on a, on a thing where the where the Smithsonian's Marine Division was ha going to the island to do start a miracles problem. I didn't even know where the island was. I couldn't find it on the map. But I bid on it and I got it. <laughs> and uh, I got, but two years later, I got an award from the England, England, because they did own the island, Carrie Coo, it belongs to Grenada, way, way down. Mm -hmm. um, for the scientists, women scientists of the year for England or something, because they still own the island when I first went down. I didn't know the first bloody thing about science. I still don't. We had the, it was the Smithsonian's engineers and scientists who had figured, I just was there for them to show us how to do it and teach the local people to do it. And it was my money that set it up. And I went broke as a fritter there because on paper it looked beautiful. But when I got there, I found that their scientists had done every bit of their research in a sterile lab in Washington, D.C. They got in the real ocean and I thought they'd drowned. <laughs> they were, it was real, really inept. And I thought the Smithsonian, to me, that was the word straight from above. <laughs> well, and that's the, this is the inspiration for well, that, Dee Dee's book. I but love that book. Tell us about your time on the island. And I loved it. I didn't leave. And I started, I had to do something to uh, my daughter-in-law would send me my uh, social security check down there, but it wasn't enough to really live on. And so I had to find something to do. And they had a moss there, it grows on the bottom. And it was coming, it was being over harvested mm -hmm. and never replanted. And uh, it was called sea moss. And you get it, you dry it and clean it and dry it. And they make it, they cook it, and it makes like a, looks like starch, and it's of that consistency. And they mix it with coconut milk and rum. And uh, so there was 
a lot of it there where I was in Kariku, but the other islands were just almost a feet of it. And so I got rope, three ply rope and twisted it and could cut pieces this big. And we grew, had masses of it like this on big hundreds. And so I started selling it. Well, I started drinking it's a delicious drink with the coconut milk. We'll have to plan our, our, our refreshments <laughs> next time. Glad that came in said, Miss D, you can't drink that. And I said, why not? I don't know if I should say it, the music company. I don't want to embarrass you all. And I said, why not? She said, women don't drink it. And I said, why? She said, because it, to make the man tig get strong. <laughs> so I waited and I didn't get any hair growing on my chest. <laughs> but the other places up island were running out of it. So what we did was just dried it, put it in bags, and I was sending it up to, uh, by boat up to uh, the other islands. So I was selling sex medicine. <laughs> Did you get rich? <laughs> but they, they well, I won that award and I had nothing to do with the scientific yeah. Scientifically, mechanically, I'm a complete moron. <laughs> well, that, that's, a, that's something fun for the Museum of History to have eventually. Yeah. It's got a great story behind it. Well, tell us about the people, because when I the read people, Island Rhythms, it's about all those friends you Oh, made. it is a wonderful, it was a completely untouched island as far as tourists and outside, them, no newspaper, no TV, nothing. And they were from the... Uh, uh, West Africa, the people there that were originally brought as slaves, they were brought by the English and then, no, by the, uh, by the French and the French were better. They were, well, I think it was just economically more feasible to keep them happy and healthy. They were a working thing. And they, the average price I checked it out was about $800 for a healthy male and that was a lot of money in those times. So you know the French, frugal French. They took care of them. They allowed them to keep their language and their religions and their music and their dances. And there were some that were given way, way back were given, there was a freed slave this and freed slave that with, with a little piece, piece of land. Those were usually the house slaves that they got really attached to. But then later, the Scotch, sent over a bunch of indentured servants, which were almost like, and they intermarried. And the result physically were very lovely looking people, mm -hmm. very lovely. Mm -hmm. And so they've got that mixture, the, uh, and a little Catholicism from the Catholic missions <laughs> and voodoo from West Africa uh -huh. and their whole religion was based on the drums. They had three drums, the big drum, everything was based on. And these people still did the dances, the dances, the songs, and the mute and the words and the language. They're, they're, and that book is, is about these people. They were naive and completely innocent in some ways but wiser than Solomon and others. Yeah. And that's what I tried to put in there. They were, it was no outside influence. Like they, I had uh, one day I was there on my place up on the hill, the oceans here, a little cliff in the ocean there and a long hill up. And I see this guy coming up on a, on a donkey and he come up and he came, Miss Lady, they call her Miss Lady. <laughs> and, and, uh, he brought me some lobster. I said, well, thank you. He said, his name was Lassius. And I was trying to figure out where that came from because they were named after Hercules because their ancestors were straw, these things. Mm -hmm. But I never heard of Lassius, so I wrote that down. And I said, come on in and have a cup of coffee. We went through the house to get on the porch where we were looking at the seat. And Glenda, who worked for me, local lady, came in and she lips pooched out, so I knew she wasn't happy about something. And when he left, I said, what, what was the trouble? She said, we don't invite Lysias in the house. And I said, well, why not? She said, 
He's a good fellow. He tells a good story. He said, but he got the sticky finger. We don't want him to get into trouble, so we do not invite him in the house. <laughs> and that was typical of them. They knew each other, and they knew their faults, and they knew their weaknesses, and they they lived with that happily. Like I asked her, she was going to get me a, what was it, something, avocado, or it, was, it had to do with an avocado, a lime, so I wanted to get me some lime. And she said, uh, I don't got no lime tree. I said, if you've got lime tree, bring a couple of limes. Tomorrow. I don't got no lime tree. I said, you've been here, what, 300, 400 years, you don't have a lime tree? <laughs> and she said, I don't need me no lime tree. My neighbor, she got one. What she got, I got what I got she. She said, I got Aww. an avocado tree. She don't got no avocado, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but I mean, that was the way they lived. And it was, to me, very beautiful. They, they. How long did you live there? About, about was it 11 years, Bill? 11 years. That poor soul back there is my, is my son. <laughs> He's trying to hide in the corner. Oh, and Margaret. I didn't see her. Margaret has type the poor sweet soul. She can read my writing. She can decide for <laughs> We need Margaret for that next book, too. But staying on this topic, I have got to tell you how lovely these pieces are how your last example was person to person equal to equal human being to human being and that rings throughout this will you pick out a piece and read it to the group do not what i want will you pick a poem and read it sure. to the group which one anyone you'd like well i think if you get the book start at the beginning and read through because i first introduce you to the to the place and and, and then uh, and then, uh, well, I'll read the first one. Okay, it's called An Honest Place. There's a Caribbean island that I know where the days are long and trade winds blow. It's there I go in dreaming time, far from cities strident climb. There twice a week the mail boat comes, and on moonlit nights you hear the drums of Africa's soul upon the beach. There's not a one that doesn't reach with its throbbing voice and dancers bold as it tells the stories and deeds of old of people of color under the sun, living and playing and sipping rum to dance and sing when work is done. It's an honest place where dreams don't lie. It's the only place for such as I. That's the first one. The first, the, the um, photographs this painting, the paintings in here are all mine except the one on the cover. That was my husband, and he did it in, in Mexico, but nobody would know the difference. It's the same kind of drum. So, <laughs> <laughs> and the photographs are ones that I took down there, and uh, they're fun. You can like read another. <laughs> we'll take two. <laughs> it's got it's got like about the uh, a bunch of their well this one i'll read to you a rudolph the departed it was the third night of the nine the same group friends and cousins all kneeling except the very old and infirm they were saying the rosary the rosary for the dead for the departed rudolph may his soul rest in peace gnarled old hands smooth young hands all f fingering bright plastic beads pinks violets and blues the beads browns white and tans the hands each pair clasped in personal grief yet all bound by a common thread as lips repeated the age old at me as smooth beads slipped through practice fingers one by one the literate little litany droned on comforting through the ages for the departed rudolph may his soul rest in peace gathered in the circle are strong faces Faces of those who have known the battles of life and death and have won a degree of peace. Island seafarers for generations that they know to love the living and to mourn the dead with smooth beads slipping through practice fingers and soft voices praying for Rudolph the departed may or so to be. Anyway, they're fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think uh, what I really hope is that whoever gets it, that you get to kind of know the island and it's there's it's about 
14 miles north of Grenada, the tail end of the windward. And in between us, I love it, it's there, there's an underwater volcano called Kikum Jenny. And I'm hoping she <laughs> kicks up uh, big enough to make a wall around it. But I'm worried now because Glenda tells me that the outside people are beginning to come in. They've got a sandals on the north end, the closest to us, of Grenada. And, oh, and there's a big old church that's been there forever. And they're very superstitious and they have all their rituals. And when Tickham Jenny erupts, it makes the bell ring. And so they think it's God warning them that, that she's, I think they're all those wonderful things you have yeah. to know about those. Kick them, Jenny, watch the news. We'll, all be, we'll say we knew about this. Okay, who's got a question for Miss Dee Dee? Oh, I've got a dozen. How right did back. you end up on Amelia Island? Uh, we were, my husband was a missile scientist and my boys were, six and seven or five and six i don't remember which which was it six and seven six and seven <laughs> and we were driving down to the cape they'd been in new york and business we we're driving down to cape and i it was time to get a place cape for the, huh the cape cape canaveral, cape canaveral. oh cape canaveral <laughs> yeah and and we had um it was time to look for a motel and I said, I was looking at the map, I said, there's an island, let's go see what it's like. And we drove out, it was beautiful. It was 1957, I think. Nine. Nine. 59. 1959. I'm so glad you're there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the road out was beautiful. And when we got here, we saw, I saw all these big lights and I thought, before we got to the bridge. And I said, shoo, it's all full of condos. And it wasn't, it was the mill lights. <laughs> so we stayed and rented a place and moved back here, rented right on the beach. On, it was on North Beach, right on the beach. And um, eventually we fell in love with it and uh, bought property here. And my boys started in school here and graduated. Oh, I loved it. Somebody's going to ask about the boat ramp. Right? Yes, that's my Okay, question. okay. <laughs> Go ahead. The boat ramp. Um, is it county that bought it or the city? County. Okay. Well, they wanted it. And they were uh, trying to buy son. My son owned it. And I think he refused to sell it to him, and they were frantic to get it. <laughs> And I think he blackmailed them. He would sell it to them if they put it, my name on it. <laughs> I'm not they're sitting back part there in the corner the trying to look in the part, part of the deal. Uh, <laughs> that's part of the deal. Okay, yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you remember me, Lowell, Paul. Yeah, Lowell, I love, you're Lowell? Yeah. Oh, for God's sake, of course I remember you. <laughs> you remember Bill remembers. Did you know that was him? No, I didn't. Turn around, Bill. I was sitting back. Yeah, it's called yeah. silver. In the hair. That's right, it's the hair. Yeah. I started drawing that when COVID hit, and I said I wasn't going to get it cut until COVID was gone. <laughs> Here we but are. I, so you were once a shrimp boat captain. Oh, yeah. What was the name of your shrimp boat? Which one? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, the first one was what? Heart's Desire? No, the first one was the Sunrise. No, though, I had to bought the smaller one, about 65 foot. Uh, I don't from a local that. guy. Yeah. Um, what Captain Van was it? No, that's when he was my half brother. Oh, your half brother? I thought he was your, your boyfriend. Jewish <laughs> <laughs> oh, relations, that'll get no spread that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the first one was a small one I bought from a local man, and it was too small. It was a rough trip going to uh, to Aransas to fish following the shrimp. So I sold that, and then I bought the was it Sea Mimi or the Lady Weasel? What did I name it first? It was the I think it was the. Lady Weasel. Lady Weasel. It was Lady Weasel. Lady Weasel was first? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I did some, a little bit of work for the uh, uh, customs that resulted in a lot of drug people being put in jail. And they saw that 
wanted me to change my name and move, and I said, I'm not about to. <laughs> so is there a mystery coming up next, a, a thriller? Based, yes. based on oh, yeah that's gonna be fun <laughs> no not has that nothing no. to do with that i no. just changed the name of the boat and refused to leave oh, told them they better be dang sure that i live to retire and be an old lady <laughs> so they said they would and everybody that we put in jail they went and told they better hope i live a long life <laughs> so I, but anyway the uh, no the mystery um uh, I'm in room 2217, so I'm gonna call it room 2217. I was sitting there thinking, we have no key. They won't let us lock our doors, and that bothers me, because uh, we're all old, and we might be unconscious on the floor, blah, blah, blah. And they don't, uh, everything is built well and strong to keep sound, so you're quiet in there. And uh, so I th got to thinking about it. It would be a great place for somebody that was dishonest to come in, uh, everybody, everybody in in sir and dining has keys so they can bring meals in. Everybody in that does the maintenance, they all have keys. There are three groups there, and everybody in the healthcare, they all have a key. We cannot lock our door. So I figured it would be a perfect place to, to if you were a crook. You come in, you've got a key that opens everybody's door. You can look at their schedules and find out if they're down, what time they eat breakfast, what time they go to the gym. Mm -hmm. And you could do it so easy by, like, say somebody like me, because I could get my head if it wasn't on my shoulder. They uh, go down and say, take your nightgown off the bed, take it away. And so I'll report that my nightgown, somebody has stolen my nightgown. They'll come up, they'll look, and it's not there, blah, blah, blah. And three days later, my night ground is back. So I call and say, I found it. It was hidden in the corner of the cloth, fell back and forth. So they'll say, well, she's really demanding, you know. <laughs> so two weeks later, my diamond ring or my pearls are missing, something good. And they'll say, well, she's done it again. <laughs> and so they, they just figure your mental, well, it could easily happen. Mm -hmm. It could yeah. because we, I do not like not being able to lock my door mm -hmm. and not have a gun. I've had a gun all my I don't know that. So I can't, they won't let me even bring an antique in to hang on the wall. But what I did get, and I haven't really mentioned it to them, I have two of those. I found it in the catalog. Little plastic very feminine, lavender, uh, <laughs> guns that, sh that shoot 18 foot and 18 times, and it's that something gas that gets in your eyes. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. So this is going to be in an upcoming thriller that you yeah. write. So tell us about this next one that I know you're working on. You had a, a, a oh, friendship with Cindy. Yeah. Tell us We're about Cindy. Who's Cindy and what was your, what was that friendship like? It was, she was a wonderful woman. And, oh, okay, thank you, honey. Yeah, see, I can't remember anything. I thought I'd do it, but I did. Okay, this is uh, Cindy and I, uh, Cindy Karnager Ferguson. She's a, a, we were really close. She was like a sister that I never had. And a lot of things about our upbringing and all were very similar. And Cindy Cindy's and I, mother was Lucy Ferguson. Is that Lucy right? Lucy was her mother. Lucy was her mother. Okay. Lucy so that big mother. portrait. Yeah. At Cumberland at yeah. the Grayfield. <clears throat> and uh, um, we decided she writes poetry too. We were going to write a book together. Put her poem up, say about the sea and mine here on the next side. The same with love, our feelings about everything. And we were going to call it Two Old Broads. <laughs> and we figured we'd sell like crazy because of her name, the Carnegie name being on it. I said, everybody will buy it for that. And so we started. And uh, she died on me. And so I, I started this book. Did she live with you? Did she live where you lived? Uh, did, did she Oh, no, live no, no. I was living in town then. Uh, I, my son had a bought a 
uh, duplex in town and on 6th Street. And he had his mother-in-law on one and me on the other. <laughs> <laughs> and this was for Cindy. She died three years ago, January 24th, 2013. Cindy, you're such a bitch. That's what you always used to say to me. Dee Dee, you're such a bitch, but I love you. Well, I love you too, but I'm furious with you for up and dying on me. You're not here to argue with me, so I'll say what I really feel. You'll hate it, of course. To me, you've always been very familiar. Our upbringing and the time of our growing up, our lost time. I think it left us adrift somehow. You, to me, are a strong woman, but at the same time, very fragile wanting so badly to be loved because of what you were, not who you were. And that was all of her life. She said, Dee Dee, I've never known if any of the men has to love me, if they love me because of the woman I am or if I was because of the Carnegie and the Cumberland and the contacts she had. The poems you wrote show me your real strength and your real beauty. They're powerful and beautiful, clear, and a bit of your soul comes shining through. I'll miss you, you silly damn woman, I'll miss you. That's the beginning. So if you don't like that one cuss word, that's the only one in there. <laughs> <laughs> Cindy, she wore many faces. Some were nonsensical, but in them were sweetness and the gentleness, an overwhelming need to be loved. She was remarkably strong in some ways and fragile as a wisp of smoke in others. It was a tragedy that she never seemed to realize her own priceless worth, her ability to love and her generosity, or her wonderful ability to laugh at the world and at herself. I loved her. I hope she knows somehow that those who knew her loved her well. I envy her, for she had one thing that many seek and never find. Who was, she said, her love and soulmate. She said goodbye to him, May 9th, 1991. I hope that they got her now. Anyway, it's about her yeah. and, and that island. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, well, Didi will be at the signing table. So if you'd like to have more, if you'd like to pose other questions, you'd like to get some books signed. Um, you pick them up here and ring, they'll ring you up downstairs. Dee Dee Bartels, until next time, okay. thank you for being here. Yeah. Thank you.